Welcome to Science and Wisdom Live, where scientists and meditators meet. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to get to be part of such a esteemed group of people that get to speak with and also um, such an important topic that is very, very beneficial. So uh, I'm really happy to be here um, and not to say much. <laughs> so um, I wanted to, to start out just asking this basic question of our, our panelists about defining trauma, that what trauma is according to your perspective and why it's relevant to your work uh, either prefer personally or you know within the the matrix of people and organizations that you're a part of. And if you'd like, Deb could start out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, happy to. Yeah, it, it's a it, it's a fascinating question for me because again, I look through the lens of of our biology. So through the nervous system's um, language, what is trauma? Trauma is um, this place where we can no longer hold on to autonomic regulation, where we're we're pulled into one of our survival responses and can't find our way back home to regulation. So traumas that that biological experience of of um, dysregulation and either fight, flight or or collapse, disconnect without the ability to 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 come back into regulation and connection. Um, Steve Porges, um, my dear colleague who'd created, developed polyvagal theory, um, said that uh, trauma is a chronic disruption of connection. And I think if the nervous system was going to answer your question, Scott, that's what it would say. It would say it's a, it's a disruption of the ability to connect either inside um, to others, to the world, or to spirit. So it's that disconnected experience that happens and the um, the experience through the lens of the nervous system is, you know, as as um, we were saying in the beginning, what is trauma? Trauma is not um, what happens to us. It's not the thing that happens to us in in my world. It's how our nervous system responds to what happens to us. So for for um, one person, um, an event may be. Um, highly traumatic because their nervous system can't find the way to regulation, whereas for another person, they dysregulate and find the way back. So it doesn't leave that traumatic imprint. So, you know, I, I think that um, is my sort of a look at trauma. So when I, you know, look at it um, out at the world, um, it's the, the things that are happening then get filtered through um, how is this person's nervous system responding to what is what is happening? In this moment, um, and you know, on a um, on a personal level, you know, the, the, we we experience trauma ourselves all the time. Everyone here joining tonight, if you think about your nervous system, your nervous system lets you know clearly when something is is dysregulating and we can't find our way back. And my work um, is helping people learn to tune into that and listen and then honor what they're hearing from their nervous system so that they can then take action. So, um, you know, and I, I think um, we're good at that, not good at that, depending on what's happening in, in our lives. Um, I've had a recent experience where it was very humbling for me to, to recognize that this is what I do for a living, and I was not paying attention to what my nervous system was telling me, right? So, so it became a, a great big traumatic moment because your nervous system is going to um, get your attention one way or another. So, you know, if we don't listen, something that could be resolved easily and might not leave that traumatic imprint, I might be able to find my way back. If I don't attend to that, it becomes bigger and bigger and then leaves a big traumatic imprint. Mm. So that's where I will start. Mm. And David, would you like to share your view sure. of defining trauma? Yeah. I, I think I think Deb defined it so wonderfully, right? It is a response to an exposure or an encounter to some sort of physical assault, emotional assault, or violence, right? 
um, and that overwhelms our ability to cope with it. Uh, I think that's one of the, the keys there. And as, as Deb pointed out, it is pervasive. None of us can escape it, right? Um, if you are a human being on this earth, you have not escaped trauma. Um, one person, very simply, trauma is a deep emotional wound, right? It causes this deep emotional wound. But like, like the trauma in my world, right, in this sort of contemplative world, uh, is a fragmentation or a disconnect between mind and body that creates a fundamental belief that we must portray who we are in order to survive, right? So there is, um, to say it in, a, in another way, it creates a situation where we are never at home with ourselves. Um, where the mind and body are disconnected in such a way that the mind through memory and imprint can actually continue to traumatize the body, right? Um, and so in my work at CMIND and in my academic life, um, studying the intertwining of socially engaged B Buddhism and Ubuntu, uh, what I come to understand is that um, trauma is very much individual, but it's also communal, much like healing, is also a communal undertaking. Um, it's an event or an occurrence that touches everyone and everything, right? There is, um, it may have happened to me, but it impacts everyone in my surroundings. And again, healing is much of the same way. Healing is this deep energetic and spiritual communion with yourself and with all things, with the ancestors, with those that are seen and unseen. In my world of contemplative practice, um, contemplative practices, in my opinion, are about helping us to build awareness of the body and what is going on in the body, the sensations of the body. It's about creating new maps of the mind, right? Um, it's about cartography, not tracing, uh, as Deleuze and Guattari would say. Um, and it allows us to begin the process of coming home to ourselves and feeling safe with ourselves first before we share that out into the world. Mm. And Rob, how about your your definition and personal connection to this? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily have a definition. Um, yeah. What I would say is very similar, I think, to what the others have said in that um, we inhabit an environment that is impacting us all the time and our capacity to respond to that impact varies from person to person our, our capacity to cope with or to enable our responses to that environment to move through and not become embedded in our system is very different from person to person so a lot of the impact of our environment and how we respond to it emotionally is a very natural process it's not about trauma it's about how we actually naturally engage with an environment that affects us a bit like we experience changes in the weather and they have an impact on us but we find some way of enabling it to to move through so to speak the, the danger can be that that it's our response to that that is the biggest um, challenge and for some of us how we respond to it uh, leads us to a place where we can't cope, where we can't self-regulate, where we lose the capacity to, to naturally function in a certain way. And then we, we adopt certain ways of coping with that impact, which often involves in some way freezing it, of, of tightening around it, of, of causing it to become lodged, embedded in our system in a certain way. That then can get buried and left there and we don't necessarily even recognize it sometimes until something re-triggers it or, or brings it back to the surface again and then the question can be how on earth do we start to, to work with this as it arises <clears throat> and as someone involved in the contemplative world and the meditation world i think we have to be quite cautious about how much meditation can actually be the kind of magic bullet that can resolve it because I don't think it is I think meditation can facilitate certain experiences and certain ways of, of unfreezing what's become stuck in our system 
but from my own experience of working in retreats and my own meditation practice and so on, it's about degree. And that, you know, the word trauma, it, it, in a sense, it covers a huge spectrum from trauma that's quite extreme, or we could say every instant of our day is impacting us. Do we call that trauma? Not necessarily. It's usually when it impacts us in a way that we can't cope with it. But then within the context of, of the process of meditation, in some ways, meditation can help us to become aware of ways of being with what's arising and enabling it to move through and begin to be healed. But a lot of the time, when it's quite strong trauma, meditation doesn't necessarily always help either. We need a lot more than meditation to be able to, to cope with it. So I think my, from my own sort of background, I've become very aware that working with people in meditation retreats and so on, many, many ways that people can naturally um, enable emotional wounds and so on to move through and be healed. But then there are, we come up against those aspects of what we might call deeper trauma, where actually it needs a lot more than meditation. And, and, and it, it requires a lot more support than just hoping I can sit on my own in my meditation space and, and I will resolve my trauma. It's not as simple as that. So, so I think this whole field is something that, that is, um, requires a lot more exploration of the nuances of what can and can't help around how we begin to heal. And I've just had a trauma. My mother broke as I was talking. Oh, no. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, that's always a good sign of that your practice is at least quite <laughs> vigorous and regular. <laughs> well, Rob, could you... Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about a specific example of how contemplative practices can help transform and heal trauma from you know, meditation, mindfulness? And then we'll ask you know, other two guests too to reflect on that since you brought up the topic. Yeah, okay. Um, again, see, I, think, I think it's about degree too, in the sense that um, you know, in my own experience of working with emotion, strong emotional um, the arising of strong emotional wounds or feelings that I have the if I have the resources and the capacity to be with it in a way that that doesn't go back into that frozen contracted place but instead enables it to begin to move through if I have if I can have the capacity to do that then it's incredibly liberating and in fact the the freedom from it enables some a, a very different way of being in relationship to ourselves but if it's too strong, then it can actually have the opposite effect. It can, it can re-stimulate re a traumatic reaction. And I go back into contraction and freezing and holding. And, and then that's not so helpful. So my own sense of it is it's about degree. And I know, you know, I've been in therapy a lot as well. And in my time in retreat, I could see there were um, ways in which I could work with a lot of my emotional process. And that that was fine. And then there were occasional things that I, I might come up against where actually I think I need some more help with this. I can't do this on my own. Yeah. Mm. yeah David, do you want to talk a little bit about how contemplative practices uh, can help with trauma and, and where they where they don't help, as Rob was talking about? Yeah, I, I can't agree with Rob more. There are the varying levels or degrees of intensity, right? Mm. Um, and what I found in my own practice is that I could not sit my pillow and wish it to go away, <laughs> right? Uh, um, which is what I wanted it to happen, right? That this traumatic event or these traumatic events that have happened over uh, my time here on this earth, you know, you want those things to, you want to touch them and you want them to disappear. It doesn't always work that way, right? Especially when sitting your pillow. And there are times when you need more help. Um, and so I, I also do a ton of therapy um, every Monday uh, evening for the last half decade. Um, and we are really working on imagining conversations with the inner child, right? Um, which is not fun ever, uh, but very necessary, right? To go back to those moments where you feel you were traumatized and to touch them and to speak to that child in a way um, that you can now as an adult without becoming the child, um, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. That wasn't your question. Your question was, was how does contemplative practice help? One of those, so that imagining is a practice, 
right? The sitting with touching, imagining is a practice. I think um, there was an old Jesuit priest once uh, who was giving a talk and something was happening in the room and he began the talk with every interruption is an invitation. Um, and I thought, how profound. It's true. Um, and that for me is what meditation is in the day. It is an interruption that is an invitation to go deeper, right? To uh, become aware of where my body is out of whack, what I'm feeling in that day, to have uh, an awareness of this arising. And, um, you know, for me, contemplative practice helps us to become more aware of the traumas. It doesn't necessarily heal those traumas, right? There's a whole lot of other work that has to happen on the back end, but it does help, in my opinion, to rejoin and remember uh, our bodies, our minds, and our spirits, yeah. right? Um, and sometimes, only for that 30 minutes I'm sitting on the pillow, am I a whole person? Um, <laughs> And when I get up from it, which is not the point of practice at all, right? But when I get up from the pillow, I become this disjointed figure once again that is refragmented into the world uh, as mind, body, or spirit. And typically, I dwell within my mind. And so it's uh, practice for me, especially mindfulness practice, right? Is about remembering to come back to the present moment. It's about unlearning what I've learned in terms of how to avoid the pain of the trauma, um, which is sometimes necessary to get through the day, uh, right? So it's not always this, this helpful thing. Um, and it, it is, especially mindfulness in particular, I'll, st I'll stick there in meditation. They are about setting an intention, right, to remember those three parts of ourselves that are always, that are most often fragmented in Western society. Um, and it's a, an ability to cultivate an awareness and a return back to it over and over again. It's also about, for me, remembering to give attention to the present moment, to learn to drop down from my mind into my body. Um, that's another thing that we work on a lot in my therapy uh, work is this body practice. Right, um, we become disembodied yeah. uh, when you have experienced trauma, right? Mm. And then it's just disassociation. And so to learn to drop back down in your body, to touch those feelings, to process them and then to let them back up, to let them go without judgment um, is a practice. Um, and it's one of the ways in which contemplative practices can, again, help us become more aware of them. Um, and to learn to cope with them better when the body becomes overwhelmed. Yeah, and Deb, what, what would you add on the how contemplative practices help help transforming and healing trauma and, and where they you know fall short too? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by listening to both Rob and, and David and, and the um, I will answer the question, but I just wanted mm. to say that the piece that resonated so, with me from both of um, your um, conversations, your wisdom, with some sense of home, right? Coming home, and how we 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 become um, homeless when when we are taken out of of this place. And there's something very very um, powerful about a sense of home, right? That embodied home, and and in um, you know in in the autonomic nervous system, we all have a home in that state of you know what we call ventral that ventral vagal state of regulation and connection right and so it lives in each of us it may the pathway may be covered up maybe not may not have been traveled often or or recently but it lives there it is a biological fact that every human being has this pathway home and so you know what your talking about both of you with contemplative practices or finding ways to safely travel that pathway. And, and um, for, for my work, it, it's, it's having enough of that regulating energy circulating in our system so that we can go visit the dysregulated places where the trauma is held, right? And it's not held in our brain. It's not a cognitive experience. It's an embodied experience we we tell our clients all the time if you could have thought your way out of this you would have done it long ago 
right? It's yeah. not a thinking your way out process. It's a, it's a, it's a going back, revisiting safely. And I think where trauma therapy had had gotten off track for a long time was was the the revisiting, but it wasn't safe to revisit. Mm. Right? We didn't create the conditions of safety that made me feel like I can stay anchored in enough regulation so that I can go back and be with that experience that's held in my survival states. Right. And, and that's this beautiful, you know, next level practice. And, and I think in your contemplative practices and in, in being on the pillow, so to speak, you're beginning to build that capacity to, to stay anchored in enough regulation so that you can then can go visit the, 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 the places of suffering that are held in our survival energies. And I think that's beautiful. And, and, and that just something so, so precious about a sense of coming safely home. Right. Mm. Mm. Okay. Can I add something to that, Deb? I think I agree with you completely. I think the one thing that I would add to that is that often we leave the body because that body home wasn't safe. Um, and in a sense, it's safer to be dissociated rather than back in the body. Mm. And so the process of returning in, you know, returning into relationship with the body for some people is not easy because that was the scary place. Mm. And so how we yeah. then recreate a sense of the safety and the compassionate holding environment that means I can come back into the body gradually and begin to make friends with it again, knowing that I'm going to touch into things that may not be comfortable, but that I then have some of the, the resources to be, to be able to deal with it, is quite an important part of that journey, I think, isn't it? I mean, I, I call it befriending your nervous system, and yeah. I don't use the word body often. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a biological system. We're going to get to know and befriend, and sometimes yeah. that's, a, that's an easier pathway in. Because yes, we, we, we live from here up, you know, we yeah, exactly. leave our body, we live from here. And so remembering you have a heart, you have lungs, you have a nervous system that works in these particular ways to always in service of your survival um, is, is a, a gentle way to begin to return yeah. to that place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and to also add to that, I think the, the, the difficulty certainly for me, and I think for many others, when I come back into relationship with what's there, then some of my habitual ways of responding to it and reacting to it are still there. So I'm, I'm needing to learn, and I think this connects with what something David said, I'm needing to learn a, a different way of being with awareness within it that isn't going back into, I've got to get rid of this, I don't like these feelings, I don't want these feelings, um, and being afraid of them or, or kind of struggling with them, fighting with them, and instead actually befriending them and starting to open with a sense of kindness and compassion. And, then we can shift into relationship with ourselves again. Yeah. And that kindness and compassion um, is based in our biology, right? It is not a, a that is not a cognitive experience. Right. It, it emerges from our biology, which I find so fascinating. Yeah. Mm. David, could you, you elaborate? Wanna... Could you elaborate on that, Deb, though? Why? Yeah. I, I bet there's some people thinking like, do they really do kind our kindness and compassion really innate yeah. to human beings? There's, there's a lot of people who might argue the opposite. Kindness, kindness, yes, kindness and compassion are are um, innate to our human experience. We are wired to be compassionate beings. And um, Dr. Keltner at the Greater Good Science Center has done a lot of research around around that. And unless we have enough of that ventral vagal energy, alive and circulating in our system, we can not be compassionate. It, it, it is, it is a, it emerges from that biological state, that autonomic state of, of ventral energy. And I just find that, that both um, wonderful and, and terrifying, right? Because it means that every human being has access to compassion. And it also means that when I'm not compassionate, you know, I, I can turn toward my nervous system and I can do something to help bring that state back so I can be compassionate. It's not a, it's not a cognitive choice I make. And so I, I do think it's, it's fascinating. I think the research, I, I, I love knowing that we are built to be compassionate. Right? We're wired to be compassionate beings. I think that's that's a beautiful thing to to know that that science has showed us that. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. 
interesting. Yeah, it's mm. very interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you know, in some of the work that I do around generational trauma and racial trauma, like this notion that we are wired to be compassionate given the myriad of years of the lack of compassion um, mm. is startling to me, right? It, it means that there was perhaps um, an intentional right, denial of this sort of bodily or biological function, or uh, as, as Resma Minikin says, it's the result of, of uh, you know, in, in America, we talk about things in terms of white and black, right, in terms of race, right? It's the result of um, white trauma, right, inflicted upon itself. Um, that you can then do this to another group of people. And so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm sitting with that thought, Deb, and I'm thinking, huh, how does this work? Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is it is a, um, a paradigm shift when we think about the nervous system driving um, compassion or um, um, abuse or, or any of these um, experiences we have to think that, that it emerges from our state Right. It doesn't mean I'm not responsible for what I'm doing, but it means that that if I know it's emerging from my state, then there's something I can do about it. And if we think about the years of, of um, racial trauma, of, 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 you know, of slavery, of white um, um, infliction of suffering, if I look at it through the lens of the nervous system, I, I, I think about um, people who are um, acting out of fear from a, a survival state, right? And people who are in their own suffering. It doesn't doesn't dismiss their responsibility. Um, it, it's just a, 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 another way of, of adding to the, the equation because if I want something to change, I need the other person to be in a place of enough regulation where they have the, the capacity to be in conversation and and um, think about doing things differently, which is not what you can do from a survival state. Mm. Huh. Mm. I love it when people do that. Hmm. Now, now, you're, now you're thinking, what is going on? Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, so Deb, can I just ask this then? If we, yeah. if we consider some of the potential um impacts of very early prenatal postnatal environment where there maybe wasn't the compassionate presence of the mother ground mm -hmm. that gets very embedded in our nervous system mm -hmm. and i wonder how that impacts or or affects what you're describing because it sort of sounds like that almost runs against what you're saying well it creates a, a sensitivity to yeah. certain survival patterns. You were talking about patterns. Mm -hmm. We have embedded autonomic patterns, habitual survival patterns we simply enter into um, when familiar cues come up and we don't, we don't recognize, we just enter into them and then we think this is the way the world is and this mm -hmm. is the story we're, we're carrying. And if, we're, if we come into the world and are met with a, with a, you know, a welcoming other, then mm -hmm. we don't learn how to co-regulate. We don't learn that skill, right? We have to self-regulate for survival. And that looks very different than self-regulating from a place of safety. And so, yeah. yes, it gets set up very early. The lovely thing that science tells us is that the nervous system is being reshaped in every moment. Mm -hmm. So we're not stuck in the pattern. Even though I'm 69, I've had patterns for decades i'm not stuck in those patterns that's why we go to therapy that's why we we sit that's why we do all these things because it can change right yep. and that's the hope for moving forward right that that enough nervous systems are going to reshape so that we begin to have a different different world we live in mm. yeah yeah each of you talked about the body that I was, I was struck by how each of you talked about trauma as this disconnection between the body and mind or body and, or, or, and nervous system, nervous system and mind. Could, could you elaborate that on a little bit? I, I know there is some scientific research that shows trauma gets stored somehow physically. And, and I've heard people talk about, you know, releasing trauma and it actually feels like in a specific part of the body that it's released. So can you talk a little in a little bit more detail about how the body plays a role 
in healing trauma? Because um, I think a lot of us, when we think about contemplation, we think of that as pure mind that we get away from our from our body. But I think each of you would probably argue something quite different. Mm -hmm. I, I would say the the body is a mind, right? And there are some cosmologies that believe that we're always taking in these, um, but it is its own sort of intelligence. And, and I think we understand that. Um, I'm thinking of um, Van der Kolk's uh, notion that um, that trauma doesn't is it, not experienced as memory, right? But as uh, disruptive physical reactions, right? But it is literally stored in the cells. Um, and then I go to, to epigenetics, right? And that we understand that trauma ongoing and unresolved uh, is passed down from generation to generation, right? And as a, as a black person in America, as, as an African descended American, I am the living embodiment of at least 15 generations of trauma. Um, that is um, stored in every cell, every muscle, every organ, um, you know, in yep. all of my physical body. And so what I understand about this is that it becomes imprinted on the body, right, in ways that sometimes we can't even recognize until we are experiencing the trauma over again, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I had an experience recently um, and I'm realizing in that experience, right, in go, talking through this with my therapist, that my body froze. My brain was very active and get out of this, get out of this, get out of this, but I literally froze. Um, and then you go into those judgmental thoughts, right, which the pillow helps me to sort of relieve of, I should have reacted differently. Um, but the body, um, you know, I hate to say it, but the body remembers, right? What the mind forgets. And so my body remember that trauma. And while my brain was saying run, my body literally was frozen. Um, it doesn't answer your question. I mean, there's a whole conversation we can go into somatic therapy and how, how all of that works and all of that good stuff. But, but that was a real example of like, whoa, I have no control mentally over this thing. That lovely experience of your nervous system acting in service of your survival. Your nervous system did it for you. Your brain was, you, if your brain and your nervous system are in a struggle, your nervous system is going to win every time. It's going to take precedence. And it acted in the way it felt was necessary in that moment. And then your brain comes in and starts, you know, judging and criticizing and all that. But again, if we can come to the nervous system and say, it did just what. Yeah. It felt what's needed in the moment and bring that yeah. compassion. Mm. Mm. That's an extraordinary capacity that we have, isn't it, to survive those things. I think the other thing that, in terms of the relationship to the body, is that in a way trauma is only healed in the present. And that sense of being in the present is about coming back into a direct relationship with its process as it begins to re-emerge and can move through again in a different way. So the body is crucial in that. I guess in in relation to that it's not just the body it's also how we bring a quality of attention or a quality of awareness into that that enables the, the freedom and the and the openness for something to be able to then reawaken and move through but the body is crucial and i think coming back to some of our original kind of comments one of the things that has felt tricky for me in relationship to how um, meditation practice can often be brought into our Western experience is that it's very easy for us in the West to become disembodied in our meditation as well and, and anyone who's involved in tantric practices where there's lots of conceptual visualizations and this sort of thing going on it can be incredibly disembodied and that isn't a healing process we're missing something there so unless we come back into the body and begin to restore a sort of subtlety of awareness of those processes in the present then they're not going to heal in the same way. So yeah, the body crucial. Yeah. So that yeah, that brings up the the kind of too much mind question of how do we avoid bypass? There's this term spiritual bypass. Um, that's a, a very useful term that's only come up recently and been been kind of coined recently. Of um, you know, kind of using your spiritual practice to escape rather than necessarily process 
uh, yeah. what happens with you. So can you talk about that? How, especially practically, how do we avoid um, using our spiritual practice or contemplative practice um, as a bypass or checking out compared to acknowledging and transforming trauma? I mean, if, if, if I was to say first, I think we've already touched on a lot of that, and that's the degree to which we let our spiritual practice, if we want to call it that, perpetuate the disembodiment and also perpetuate the, the kind of stuck in the conceptual mind <clears throat> rather than coming back into direct experience. So if we, if we have the idea that meditation is about transcending, then that's certainly not a Buddhist approach to meditation. It's about being utterly present with rather than transcending our experience. Um, but there are other ways that we can bypass. I mean, the bypassing thing can happen in lots of different ways. We could get caught up in, in a whole perspective that says these experiences are acceptable and, and to be cultivated, and these are to be rejected and abandoned. And that split, that division of, of these feelings are acceptable, these feelings aren't acceptable, means that we put a lot of things that are maybe naturally part of our emotional life into these unacceptable package, and we can push them into the shadow. And, and if we practice any spiritual path that does that sort of splitting, then we're kind of bypassing in some ways. We're, we're, we, we're re, how to say, we're, we're strengthening the amount of material that's left in the shadow because we're saying it's not acceptable in some way. So I think that's another way that we can bypass. And then the other way, of course, is doing practices that, that tend to keep us in a conceptual, lots of disembodied visualization, so, so that we, we don't need to deal with it, or we don't, we don't come close to dealing with it, rather than recognizing that transformation in all of those practices happens in the body. And, and as, a, <clears throat> as a tantric practitioner, I guess that's where I talk about the energy body as well, because there's, there's a lot of trauma considered to be held in the energy body that needs to be free to move through and be liberated and healed. We have to come back into the body for that rather than transcending in some way. Yeah, did David, David, any reflections on uh, avoiding bypass? Yeah, boy, it's hard. Um, that was, <laughs> it is a, tough thing to do um, because some of us do come to practice. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. Some of us do come to practice um, with this, our spirituality with an understanding that, that the goal is to transcend the present moment, right? and to transcend suffering and not, um, not to touch it and release it or to move through it. Um, in real ways. And so I've, I've fallen into this trap myself, right? I'm a, uh, I'm a Catholic Buddhist. Um, talk about trying to transcend everything, right? Um, our <laughs> spiritual, spiritual bypass, but it is, it's one of those things, what I tell folks is that the moment you find yourself going there, try and pull yourself back down, mm -hmm. right? Come back into the world. Um, I think most of the religions of the world are meant to be experienced in the present, right? Um, and there are narratives that have taken hold and we can, it's a whole different conversation, right? About meta narratives that have taken hold about, you know, you hold on in this world because heaven is your reward and all of those things, right? But what we have is now, what we know that we have is now. And so we have to live now. The, the, I'm, I'm dealing with a group now who is going through some of this, these issues of, of like, all right, well, this is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, no mud, no lotus, um, <laughs> right? That this is generative matter, if we want to think about it in that way, mm -hmm. of how we make sense of the world, right? As human beings, we're always meaning making. Um, and suffering is one of those ways that we make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And so the only way you will understand your present moment, right, is to experience it, to live it uh, mm -hmm. deeply and try not to transcend it um, or to move through it in ways that you're not recognizing it. I'll, I'll say this and I'll, I'll pass it on to Deb, but my grandmother, God rest her soul, and all of her wisdom would tell me that um, if you avoid the lesson or don't learn it, it will continue to repeat. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So if for nothing more than that lesson, not repeating, sit in the lesson, right? Sit in the discomfort of the moment of learning the lesson um, so that perhaps it may not repeat and perhaps you may learn something from it. Bless your grandmother. I love that. <laughs> and and yes, our our you know these are these habitual response patterns that get set up, and unless we can notice them, name them, and um, honor them for for why they have come into being, and then um, shape them in a new way. And and I think I don't know if this is spiritual bypass, but I think in my line of work, what people do so often is is they they want to change the pattern before they sit with it and honor it, mm -hmm. right? And so the work is to let's let's be with, let's hear the story, let's let's yeah. honor the ways your system has supported your survival, and then mm -hmm. we can begin to see what's the gift of that and how can we begin to shape it shape it differently. And I think we often don't. I think we miss that step. We want to get out of it. We want to want to have the new path. We want to have the new new pattern, and that's that's where we're heading. But but it's but we need to do this first. And so I think that's in the therapy world, we often skip that step. And then the the piece, the sort of this existential belief about ourselves, again, to come back to my own experience, I, I have held a belief about who I am as a caring person in the world, right, for, for decades. And I'm a caregiver to, to my husband, and he has recently had many complications and needs much more care. And that I was stuck in one story about what it means to be a caring person. And what happened for me was my heart simply said, no, you're done. And so I had this big medical event because the story my brain was holding on could not let go. And I think that's this experience of, of being, we have to let go of the story and to see what's the new story that can emerge. And as you both have said so beautifully, if we don't listen to the embodied experience, it will simply get bigger and bigger and bigger until it grabs your attention in, in, in some um, <coughs> you know, dream way. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But think about that for yourselves for a minute, everybody. You, you have a belief about who you are in the world, right? And, and, and what if that belief is not serving your well-being? What do you do with that? There's that, that it's a huge clash that happens. So, yeah. Mm. You've each touched, um, a couple of you have touched a little bit already on, you know, racial, social trauma. I wonder if you could reflect on um, how trauma manifests beyond the individual. So how it manifests at the national, the societal level with racial trauma, social trauma, gender injustice. Um, we've talked a little bit about how that manifests in the individual, but are there ways of transforming and healing collectively um, that we can think about? Yeah, what a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for starting, David. <laughs> a huge question. So this, this sort of racial trauma, gender trauma, all of those things, again, are things that we hold within our bodies, um, that individuals hold within our bodies, and we hold within our collective body. Um, and they make themselves manifest in a number of ways, right? So we have... Um, we in the states are in we're in this moment of racial reckoning right where we were we were experiencing these extrajudicial murders of black and brown human beings being um splashed across our screens our phones all of those things that is trauma deep 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 trauma that it's inflicting on everyone um and and you you begin to look at sort of generationally how this has played out Right. So in the States in particular, um, we've had enslavement of African people, right? That moved into Jim Crow, that moved into, you know, redlining policies and all of these things. That moved into the new Jim Crow, which is the, the rising of the prison industrial complex. Um, and so we see how all of these things make themselves manifest at every level of society, right? We can look at rates of poverty in the states and divide those along color lines, around race lines. 
right? We can look at poor housing, we can look at educational statistics and divide all of those around color lines. That isn't because um, people of color in this country aren't capable, right? That isn't because they are not worthy. It is because the systems have been set up in such a way, right? And particularly, um, I'm talking about people in power, right? So in the states that would be white people um, have their own trauma and are inflicting trauma and reinscribing their trauma and they're not dealing with it, um, right? And so we see these things sort of reinscribed over and over. You know, there's, um, I, I give a presentation every once in a while on, on uh, historical trauma. And one of the things to, ed to educators, and one of the things that they find the most troubling is that infants, right, show signs of this trauma from age zero to 36 months are already showing signs of the imprinting of this historical and racial trauma, right? That impacts their development, that impacts every aspect of their lives, and it just gets worse as they grow. Um, now, how do we heal that? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I do a little bit of the bypass thing, and I, I tell folks this, that when we talk about historical trauma, especially as an African descended person in this, in this, in this country, that yes, there was great pain, there was great sorrow, right? But there was also great resilience. There was great joy and there was great love, right? And all of those things from 15 generations ago have brought me here today, right? And so not only am I the embodiment of the trauma, but I'm the embodiment of the strength, of the resilience, of the love, of the joy, and of the brilliance of these people who endured so that I could be their faith made flesh, mm -hmm. right? Um, and to look at it in that way changes the dynamic. Now, it may be some bypassing, and I'm gonna, I'm, sometimes that's heavy, right? And to touch 400 years of trauma, don't ask me to do that today, right? Uh, or tomorrow or the next year. Um, but th those are some of the ways we have to start looking at this. One of the chief ways I say communally how we begin to heal this trauma is that we begin to tell the truth about it about its impacts, about its effects, um, and about who's inflicting them. So raising the awareness, right? Um, we need to go to therapy, right? Lots of therapy. We need to um, feel the fear of talking about it and bringing it up in the public sphere. Um, meditation and prayer, all of those things, right? And celebration. Let's celebrate that last moment, right? That all of that pain, all of that heartache was coupled in the human experience with love and joy. And it brought us all to this moment. Um, and I think that's just, a, that's a glimpse, right? But that's a really big question. Can I, can I ask you something around that, David? Many, many years ago, um, I was in Indonesia and actually it was in Bali as it happens. And I was in a village called Ubud. This was in 1972 or so. And they had a problem in the village where, the, where there was a sort of um, very strong conflict going on within the whole community of the village. And they resolved it through a kind of collective ritual. It was a dance. It was a, it was a whole sort of way in which they could, they could enact a certain process collectively. And it helped to clear through that conflict and, and, and all the trauma that it was creating. I just, I guess I wonder to what extent that kind of thing can also be useful. Maybe we've lost our capacity for it in the West, I don't know. But in a lot of indigenous cultures, they have ways of working with trauma that's a collective ritual process. Do we not have some means of doing that as a Western process? You know, not that I know, maybe Deb will, will, will know, but I don't think we have any not that I can Ooh. think of I in think terms of a collective. It. We've lost it, right. We've lost it. Um, we've lost a lot of, I think we've lost a lot of our ways of knowing mm. that don't privilege the mind, right? Um, 
and we can blame the Enlightenment for that, I think, in, in some respects, right? Um, but yeah, we don't have a collective way. And, and you know, the way, the way Resma talks about this is that there is white body culture, and then there's black culture. Yeah. And we can't deal with the collective culture until white folks deal with their own, until the West deals with the West culture, um, right? Because they're the inflictors, largely, yeah. of the violence of the trauma. Because we're also traumatized as well. Yes. Yeah. So we're just perpetuating something. Aren't we? Just perpetuating. Mm. I, I, it, it feels it feels heavy, doesn't it, at, at the moment? And I wanted to go back for a minute, David, when you talked about um, both the suffering and the celebration. Because to me, that's the beautiful both and that we need to hold on to. Um, and when we get pulled into just one or the other, we lose the capacity to to, to really be in um, the experience and to, to find our way to those courageous conversations and, and find change. It really is a acknowledging the suffering and celebrating the, the, um, the gifts. So, yeah. And I think, I do think we lose that. We go to an either or so quickly, so quickly, yeah, yeah. Which again, if you know, just to bring it back to our nervous system, you can't hold a both and unless you have enough regulating energy, mm. unless you have a, a regulated system. A, a, the either or is a, is a sympathetic um, me against you, right? And then the the um, sort of disconnected from it all, hopeless give up is is the dorsal. Um, survival response. So again, you know, if, if I, it's not going to, I can't talk about healing collective trauma, but if I started um, with individuals and began to create groups, I would find a way to help people um, anchor more in that place of, of regulation and connection so that their biology supports them in being able to, to enter into those, yeah. those spaces. Yeah. And I think you touched on something else too, right? Changing a lot of my academic work is about um, reconceptualizing the subject position, right? So um, transforming the I into a we orientation, right? That's what Ubuntu is. Um, and Ubuntu as, as a philosopher practice tells us that human beings aren't born. They are created in relationship with other human beings. And so if, if we, we perhaps need a way of being human differently, right? A different way of being human, transforming this I into a we orientation, perhaps may do something to that, that compassion nerve, right? It, it may spark it in some way. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, one of the very simple ways that, that I, I like to, you know, look out at the world, if I look at someone who is... Um, you know, behaving in a way that, that my brain really judges, that I can come back and, and first say, oh, dysregulated nervous system. And that gives me the ground for which then their, their brain is, is creating this, this, this behavior that happens, but it stems from a dysregulated system. And, and to then come back to that place of saying, oh, I've been there, right? I've been in that place, just like that person is now, I've been there too and bring a bit of, of compassion, yeah. Which is hard to do sometimes, really hard. Easier for me to stay in, in, in the, the brain story of, um, oh, I would never do that. Why are they doing that? That is a bad person, rather than coming back to, oh, right. I too have done that, right? From a dysregulated place, yeah. There's, a, there's an expression that I hear His Holiness the Dalai Lama use a lot that's very similar to this, which is the recognition of kind of equalizing self with others by recognizing that irrespective of our race, whatever, um, we all wish to be free of suffering and to experience happiness. In that sense, we're no different. And I think just that kind of consideration can be very deep, actually. It's a lovely thought to hold on to, isn't it? We all wish to be yeah. free of suffering, experience happiness, yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter how, you know, we, we may be not very skillful at it, but even the right. terrorist actually is wishing to be free of suffering to experience happiness. Right. Yeah. yeah. Ironically. Mm. 
I, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, there, there are individual e examples where a trauma that someone experiences, um, not only do they get over it, but that the trauma is a kind of catalyst to even grow, uh, very much grow as a human being um, and become even a quote, better, better human being, uh, bring out their best qualities like wisdom, compassion, and, and so on. I wonder if you can talk about that, the spiritual traditions, you know, contemplative traditions like Christianity, Buddhism, certainly talk about how, you know, suffering uh, when confronted in the right way um, is not only something you can get back to, you know, your baseline, but that it can help you expand as a human being. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Anybody? <laughs> so, so in the in in the therapy world, um, I think um, we've always had this this thought that that you know so many therapists go into therapy because we we are our own wounded healer, right? It's it's, it's that that piece, and we actually did a, a um, research study at um, the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium of of um, clinicians and asked about their prior. Um, traumatic experiences, and it turns out that we do have prior experiences. And you know, the the phase oriented way of looking at trauma treatment is that last phase is the survivor's mission. It's the giving back. It's the, you know, I've made sense of my world. I have now have a coherent story, and I um, can use it in in some way to to um, pass that on to others. And I think that I think that's very true for at least in the the therapy world that of you know that I know know so well and and um, you know that survivor mission can look so many different ways but we know it when we reach that point where where we're no longer um, in that old story right we have a new story that's emerging and the new story has um, some passion and has purpose and I think that's where it then leads us mm. Mm. I, I actually think that in many ways um, it's it's allowing ourselves to go through the experience of us. I, I'm, I'm a bit um, concerned about your word confronting suffering. Um, I'm, I'm not so comfortable with the idea of confronting it, but I think how we engage with it and how we uh, learn to be with it opens up our own capacity to to recognize the suffering of others and have a deep sense of compassion. And maybe you know, to develop the the uh, wish to awaken more fully in order to be able to benefit others, which is that whole bodhicitta intention within Buddhism, or within the Tibetan tradition, grows out of suffering and 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 grows out of the compassion that that is only going to really um, cult be cultivated by allowing ourselves to go through our suffering and to then recognize that others experience it in a similar way. And out of that can grow bodhicitta, this aspiration to awaken. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say both in the Buddhist tradition and the Christian tradition that suffering in some instances is bedrock, right? It's an acknowledgement that we all suffer. Um, as, as Deb and Rob have said, um, the question becomes, what do you do with it, right? Uh, what I tell folks all the time that contemplative practice, religion, they are methodologies, right? And method is an ontological decision always, right? It's a decision about how you, you be in the world. Uh, and so each religion, each understanding, each philosophy gives us a different way of being with ourselves, each other, and suffering in the world. Um, the goal, I think, in each of them is to sit with that suffering, but to also transform it and to understand that suffering is the shadow of happiness, right? Maybe in the Buddhist tradition now, or in the, in the Christian tradition, suffering is the, is the shadow of love. Uh, now, I don't like the idea of equating love with suffering, but oftentimes it is. Uh, <laughs> There's some element of suffering always intertwined in loving. Um, but I think what they both do is say, this is going to happen. 
you are going to experience moments of discomfort, of extreme discomfort, of pain, of, uh, of wishing things were different than what they were. They aren't. Mm -hmm. Sit with the fact that they aren't, right? But also that every cloud, every storm runs out of rain eventually, right? And so we will see um, an end to this suffering in some way, depending on your tradition, how that comes about, right? In the Christian tradition, that's death and, and ascension into heaven, right? Um, in, in other traditions, it is uh, coming to a deeper understanding of our total interconnectedness with all things here on earth, right? And then the body going in, going back into that connectedness uh, after, after life. Um, so those things are, are deeply, deeply important. Um, I'll end with this, you know, every, we're in Holy Week as a Catholic, we're moving into Holy Week, which is the high holy time of, of the Catholic calendar. And uh, every Holy Saturday, which is sort of the, the silence of the church and of this Christian story, I sit with one question that Hilton Alls posed many years ago in, uh, in a magazine in the New Yorker. And he, he asked, how do you claim space in this world and not suffer as a black man? Right, to sit with that question, to sit with it in the image of Christ crucified, right, and his eventual resurrection. And what, what came to me the other day, I was talking with someone, she reminded me that, that the suffering doesn't happen alone, right, that there are folks there to hold you up, that suffering is a communal act, and so is the healer. Um, and as in the Christian story, so was the resurrection. It was a communal act. There were other folks there um, to help this thing along. So I don't know where I was going with that, but it's there. So okay. <laughs> I'll end there. Can I, can I respond to that as well, David? Um, sure. We, we use the word suffering. And if, if I came from a fairly sort of traditional Buddhist perspective around this for a moment, I suppose we, we need to distinguish between um pain and distress and emotional turmoil or whatever and suffering yes. but pain and distress and emotional turmoil is not suffering it's what we do to it that turns it into suffering and and that's quite an important distinction in a way because to get rid of suffering is not about no longer feeling pain or distress or whatever it's about actually having a very different relationship to it that, that, that honors it in a different way. So I, I just think it's worth making that delineation really between suffering and, and the kind of, the way in which res we respond to our pain and, and all of that is actually what gives rise to the suffering, not the, not the pain itself. Thank you for that, yeah. Yeah, this also speaks to the limitation of the English language. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't want to be pedantic about it. I, just, I think it. I think it's. Um, I notice this in myself. You know that I may be experiencing some kind of distress, and and I could respond to that distress with a sense of allowing it to be as it is and to move through, or I could get very contracted around it and it becomes suffering. And that distinction between one and the other, we we can feel that in our own response the reaction that we give to things that arise in our life. And, and if, I can, if I can shift the disposition to, to react by contracting and, and getting frozen, it, it, we come back to the trauma thing again, don't we? It's the contraction freezing that fixes it, that, that solidifies it, that is actually what causes the trauma. That if we can stop that pattern, then it will move through. So there's a, there's a really important but subtle distinction, isn't there, between those two? experiences yeah thank you yes that survival energy coming to the rescue yeah we that that then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. i yeah. would i would often tell my clients i can't change what happened to you but i can help you have a different relationship with it I mean, that exactly. i think is what therapy is that that's what we do in therapy and you know so that's what yeah the the be and i think different. we can do that we can do that in the meditation process you know, mm -hmm. something arises, I could go into that contracted place, or I could mm -hmm. open to it, 
hold it with a sense of spaciousness and compassion and it starts yeah. to move through in a different way mm -hmm. mm. yeah we're we're getting around the time of um taking some questions from the rest of the audience so um people out there if you're uh, if you have a question you can click the reaction button and, and raise your hand and i'll give a uh as people start to think about their questions maybe i will ask one more <laughs> um because it's, it's they don't usually happen instantaneously uh, which is it's something david touched on about the you know the difference of how you feel on your cushion versus you know feeling a, maybe a little bit more discomfort as you go back out into the world and so i'm wondering maybe starting with david how we could process trauma actively in our relationships and our work uh, versus privately on the cushion you know they're they're triggered but they're triggered as we go out into the work out into the world and in our intimate relationships especially um but how can we actively process through relationships and work um and not just go back to the cushion and try to <laughs> try to process it there yeah mm. i wish i had a real answer to that question <laughs> <laughs> i would be a lot more well uh, i'll tell you that um you know for me it has been being able to give voice to the trauma mm -hmm. with someone who will acknowledge it and see it, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, there's, I, I go back to this quote from Toni Morrison, she was on the Oprah show once and, and Oprah asked her, you know, what do, what do children look for? Uh, what does it take to be a good parent? was the question and tony's response was all children want to know is do your eyes light up when they walk into a room <laughs> right um and it's it's almost the same thing like can you acknowledge you don't have to agree with me right but can you acknowledge that i've had this experience and can we come to a point of understanding of the experience giving voice to that experience helps me right to be able to process through when it's safe it's not always safe to do so Right. Um, and some things, as hard as it is, and I work on them every day, sometimes you have to accept the apology that was never given and release it into forgiveness while working on your own response to it. Um, but if, if I had a real question to that answer, Scott, I think I'd be a millionaire um, because I would I would bottle that up and sell it. But I, I don't know. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Did Rob and Deb have any any thoughts on that? The how, how we how we can transform out in our relationships and work. I guess there's two for me. There's two sides of that question. One is in relationship to others and and how I experience them when they're struggling in some way or when they're suffering, and the other is when I'm going through it, and there's slightly different sort of circumstances. But I mean, I think for me, compassionate presence is the most healing thing we can offer anyone. You know, if, if someone is struggling and, and suffering in some way, if I can hold that sense of compassionate presence towards them, and it doesn't mean that I have to fix it or do something about it, but to be there for them feels to be profound, actually, rather than trying to fix it. In terms of my own experience, I think rather like David saying, there's something about being able to voice it, being able to be authentic and honest and not pretend that I'm you know, spiritually correct. And spiritual correctness is the biggest disaster for, for this, you know. I think <laughs> we need to be authentic rather than when I'm doing it the correct way sort of thing. And and um, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, actually, as well, so that, so that we can be human and be, and know it's okay to have our difficulties, know it's okay to have struggles sometimes rather than, than tr thinking that the, that we have to present a certain persona to the world. And, and I think for me, it, it, um, I have a, a colleague who wrote me a piece about deep listening that I use. And it's this place of deep listening where, where my, I'm showing up to hear you with, with no agenda or my only agenda is to, is to, is to really listen. Right. It, to not not problem solve, not not not, you know, give you my experience, but just to so that you know you're known, right? And then that's what I need in in return sometimes. And I think 
for me, I help people build those relationships. They are intentional relationships we build. And, and in my world, there's a, there's a language we speak. We speak the language of the nervous system. And when we can have that shared language, then it becomes easier um, to ask for what I'm needing in this moment or to look at the other person and ask them, what does your nervous system need in this moment? To feel known, to feel seen, to feel held. So, you know, I start very small with, with two people. First, it's me and my client, and then who can my client invite into that? And we begin to build these micro communities. So, yeah. Mm. I think there's a question, Saida and Marco. I, I think you have a first question you wanted to read aloud. I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. We yeah. we a wrong pin. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes. Let me thank all the all the speakers and thank you as well, Scott. It's been a very valuable uh, and inspiring conversation. So we have a question that's been submitted. Um, privately through the chat. In recent years, Western Buddhist communities have experienced deep and pervasive personal and collective trauma with sexual abuse and betrayal perpetrated by those held in the most revered positions. Can you speak about the special characteristics of this kind of betrayal trauma? and how individuals can recover from it. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, I'd be happy to respond to that a little bit because it's, um, it's the world that I work in a lot. Um, and I have a lot of people that come to me for mentoring around that kind of experience. And I think one of the things that's most um, supportive individually uh, this is a sort of collective process i'm sure but individually is to be able to speak about it openly and freely without someone giving all sorts of prescriptions about what needs to happen or what you know how we should view it but to ha actually have have a listening you know a, a space where someone listens and hears what's happened and then begins to support enabling those feelings and emotions to, to move through as we've been talking about rather than thinking that they're wrong or inappropriate or whatever and of course the danger within the buddhist world in particular is that there are lots of prescriptions around relationships to, to spiritual teachers or gurus or whatever language you want to use that often say we're not supposed to hold certain views or feelings towards them because it's it's unskillful or it's not beneficial or whatever as a kind of denial of the reality of what we are feeling. And, and I think if we can get away from that sort of paradigm or that sort of perspective, it's really important so that we know it's okay to have the feelings that we have rather than in some ways denying them or thinking they shouldn't be there because we'll go to hell you know, if I have them. That, you know, that's, it's such a fundamentally unhelpful perspective. And, and then I think we, we also have other things where maybe we need to look at as us as westerners how we take more responsibility for calling out these things rather than assuming that our teachers have got some kind of um ultimate authority that that, that makes them right even though they're doing things that maybe aren't very helpful that, that we as westerners call it out and say that this isn't acceptable to us that you behave like this and we're often quite afraid to do that collectively unfortunately but it's something that we really need to do. It's just sort of growing up, you know, rather than staying in that slightly infantilized, idealizing place that we idealize the teachers and we don't question their, them when they do, maybe do something that's unhelpful. So that on a collective level, I think is important. So there's an individual and there's a collective process going on in this. And I, I think we have a lot to learn around it, actually. So that's a, a, a perspective anyway. Would Deb or David have anything to add on that? I think I think that was spot on. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have to. You know, I'm I'm one of those people who um, I don't do well in hierarchies because I challenge everything, um, and so it it is um, to think. And I learned that early on, right? To think. I had this conversation again, conjuring up my grandmother who was very clear with me 
that priests were men who had vices um, and who put on their, their pants the same way you did every morning. Um, <laughs> and that the only time they were transformed was when they were on the altar. When they came down from the altar, they were, they were just like you, flesh and blood again, without this ability to be held in this sort of super high esteem. And so the ability to, to, to go against the grain, right, which takes courage because that could mean some shunning and all of those other things. But to call those things out, as Rob said, um, is, is extremely important. Um, yeah. Yeah. And to not adopt Western values. I mean, the, like, can we get back to the core? Um, and looking at, you know, that's a whole different conversation. I won't, I won't get on my soapbox. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I love listening to the two of you talking about this, this world that, that is, is, um, not my world. And, and, and yet I keep making connections to, you know, to my world. It, it's not the same, but I spent many years working with um, families in which sexual abuse happens. And it's, it's that same hierarchy. It's the speaking out and not being heard. It, it's the, you know, we talk about bystanders. We talk about the non-offending parent. And where was that person when this was happening? So it's, it's, it's the same. It's a different, a different population, a different context, but it, but it is, it is the same, isn't it? You know, yeah. whether it's a family or a, or a spiritual leader or a priest, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Venerable Fabian, I think you have a question. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all. It's, it's been a wonderful conversation to listen to. And the, the, the dialogue and the chemistry of the three of you together, it's been wonderful to, to witness that. Um, and also, so it's 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 um, more of an observation, and I'm 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 gonna I'm seeking your wisdom, and and I'm articulating in my mind because I've noticed I listening to you tonight, I have this feeling of both of a sense of how privileged we are to be able to receive this wisdom and. Um, and to get some tools to help us deal um, with our, identify and, and learn to deal with our own trauma. But there's also a sense of sadness that's been emerging, I've noticed as well. And so I'm turning to you for a little bit of wisdom to help me through this, because the sadness I think has come up of feeling like, wow but you know it takes for the conditions to come together to be able to start tackling identifying tackling the traumas that we have when you think about intergenerational inter or just even within this one life um and so the sadness is like wow it it just means most people don't you know have access to that and so I wondered maybe if you could talk a little bit about that and bring, a, bring back a sense of perspective of, of, of hope. And I'm happy these conversations are becoming more mainstream. And, and through that, I think there is tremendous you know, hope and light, but it seems daunting in some ways. Like most people don't have the, the conditions um, to, so I wondered if you had something to say about that. Whoever would like to take it. <laughs> I can, I can, Fabian, I could just talk a, a bit, um, you know, in, in my work with others, I think I, one of my responsibilities is to be a hope merchant, right? That, that when I am anchored in my regulated connecting um, nervous system, that, that, that then gets transmitted to the nervous system that I'm with. And so, um, I, you know, one of the responsibilities that, that we have as humans is if we know that, then we're responsible for the autonomic energy we're putting out into the world. And if I can go out into the world from that regulated place and, and 
and know that it is having an impact on the nervous systems around me, that then um, feels hopeful. If I if I think about the whole world that the, and the, the big problems we need to change, I get overwhelmed. I go to that place of overwhelm, disconnect. That is where I go. I go to disconnect. Um, if I think about, but I can start one nervous system at a time, we can start however many of us there were today together, feeling that connection and feeling a bit of, of um, there are small things we can do. Change happens in the micro moments and, and research tells us that, that it's not one big thing that happens that makes a change, it's micro moments that accumulate. And again, that brings me hope because I can notice the micro moments. I can have those and I can can hold on to the fact that they're beginning to add up and a tipping point will be reached. So that's kind of the best I can offer. I'll throw it to David and Rob now. <laughs> David, you wanna go? <laughs> sure, thanks Rob. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave it to you. <laughs> I, I agree with that. These are, these are micro moments, right? That, um, that add up into a collective. We do what we can in our corners of the world, right? To make healing possible, to make transformation possible, and to begin um, to encounter or develop a different relationship with trauma and suffering. Um, and we lead by example, right? So if you are doing that, right? And you are leading in this way, um, then that spreads, right? All, all virtues and vices start at home and spread abroad, um, right? So start with you. The, the other thing I would say is that um, I think it's our human tendency to want to see it right away. This world was not created in a year or a day. And so, or the pain wasn't created in a year or a day. And so it's going to take time, right, to heal that maybe twice as much time as it, as it was when it was created. And so looking at this in the long view of time and history uh, mm -hmm. is also important. The, the last thing I'll say is that to make it happen, we have to use everything. You know, get in touch. I believe that rage is righteous, right? I believe that anger is a transformative energy. Yeah. I believe that we take whatever we have and we mm -hmm. use it to make manifest whatever it is we want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, if that is healing, then take everything you have to make healing manifest in the world and to create the possibilities for it wherever you find yourself planted on earth. Yeah, yeah I agree, David, yeah. Um, I, I really like what you're saying, Deb, about what we emanate if we're in relationship to something that is regulated and has a certain quality to it. If I brought that into a, into a Buddhist angle for a moment, I think something that we need to remember is that we have what we might call intrinsic health. We call it our Buddha nature, whatever language you want to use, that that is always there, it's always been there. And whatever trauma we have, it doesn't actually harm it or, or damage it. It may obscure it, but it doesn't in any way damage it. And so there is always that potential for us to awaken a relationship to that intrinsic health. And as, as we do that, we, as we connect to the source of that, then from that place, we can also emanate something which, as you, as you say, Deb, it, it, will be, it will become part of our environment. We can open that out to others in some way. And I, and I think that's individually, that feels like that's part of, for me, that's my responsibility. If I can stay aligned with that source, aligned with that intrinsic health, then I can manifest what is most beneficial in whatever way I can. And, and that grows and spreads. And, and, and part of that is, as you say, David, I think is about transforming the stuff into, into its natural potential, whether it's rage or grief or whatever. They are the source of something that we can transform and, and help others to transform it too. And I think that's particularly uh, becomes more possible the more aligned with source I am. So that connection to to Buddha nature, connect to our connection to our intrinsic health, and we all have that. Everyone doesn't matter who it is, we all have that intrinsic health. Actually, it's tragic that that it gets so obscured, but.
but it's in our human condition. It's our nature. Mm. So I feel the optimism of that, actually. And we look for those micro moments when we feel connected to what you call source, what I call a, a ventral state, with the micro moments that remind us, oh, it is there. Yeah. Right? yeah. Even in the most trauma saturated lives we're living, we all, there's another both and. We also have these micro moments of feeling okay. Right. And so to, to, to notice that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> we had a question. Um, from Christina Frasher, who uh, wants me to read the question because she says her dog is barking. <laughs> so she, she asks, how do we address our collective responsibility to offer space or not take space from uh, for those to heal from trauma? A lot of the points involve creating space and time to heal, but having that space and time can be a privilege. And perhaps we collectively take away that space and time uh, for those to heal. So any, any response to that? About how to, I guess, how to offer space um, for people to heal from trauma? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess I have a question. How do we take space away? In what ways do we do that? Because if we can see how we take space away, we might also get a sense of how we can bring it back. And I mean, I have certain space saving um, things that I bring into my life that don't give me any space at all, like the internet, you know, um, like what, you know, emails, <laughs> these space saving time, space time saving things actually take out more and more time. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't know, how do we take, how do we lose the space and how do we regain it? I think that, that relationship to space is a very key element actually to a lot of how we respond to the world around us and our disposition to respond to space is often that we can't cope with it actually because it, it threatens us in some way our, our ego doesn't like space very much and so we find things to do we get busy we get more active we get engaged with all kinds of things that that don't allow the space to be there so there's something deep in our nature that isn't very comfortable with space and, and even though we may create it in our environment, the question can be, can I allow myself to begin to make friends with space in myself, actually, rather than let's keep doing stuff because I'm anxious, because I'm insecure and, and all that, you know? I think space is quite a, is quite a challenging concept in some way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that make sense? <laughs> interesting question and i'm not sure i understood it either i like where you went with that um rob where, where i went was was um um safe space how do we space, yeah. safe space for for yeah. people and and one of the things that i you know was always um challenging in my um clinical practice was how do, how do you offer someone this one hour a week of yeah. safe space knowing that they leave your your office and go back into a world that that is not safe for them. And and I, you know, came to discover that there's there's great power in that one hour a week, right? That that it does begin to make a difference because I couldn't change what was happening when they left my office and the rest of the world they were they were living in, but I could offer them that one hour of of safe space and and that felt um, important to to recognize so that's where i went with it mm. the, mm. one of the jungian analysts that i studied with called dora kalf who invented the sand tray sand play therapy called it a free and secure space which i think is kind of what you're describing mm. yeah and I, I don't know i'm sure it can this this idea of giving and taking it away right troubles me right so how do i create an environment for psychological safety where you are able to be yourself without fear of, of violence in some way, right, is important. But I think to me what's more important is the ability to bear witness, right, to, um, to that person's suffering or trauma if invited to bear witness. To it, right? Um, and and I say that because witnessing to me is saturated in love, 
and saturating recognition, respect, awareness, all of those tenets of love, right? Um, and so this notion of, you know, I, I don't need anyone to give me space to sit with my own pain, right? I do it every day um, and I don't need permission to do it, right? And so one of these, one of the other elements here is that um, there comes a, a responsibility of ownership Right, of sitting with, dealing with, creating your own space and safety um, to process the things that you need to process. And it doesn't have to be, I think the other thing in, in that question, what I'm hearing is that, you know, this isn't like, let me go sit for hours on a, on a park bench. That's what you don't want to do, right? These could be check-ins, right? These could, um, there's a practice that I do that, that requires me to come back into my body where I unclench my jaw. Mm. where I drop my shoulders, mm. right? Um, where I, you know, move my eyes back and forth to come back into my body and stick out my tongue and exhale, right? And then three deep breaths and come back into it, right? That's a minute. Um, so space doesn't have to be this exaggerated and large thing. And, I, and I'm sure Deb can talk. I know there are some, some practices in Resmus book that helps you to reset what he calls the soul nerve, right? That vagal system um, that are a second, that, that get you back in to where you need to be. Trisha had a question. Uh, can, can I just say oh, one thing? Oh yeah, I go love, ahead, Deb, yeah. I love what you said about um, faith doesn't have to be, be big because, you know, as Rob was saying, big faith is, is um, feels dangerous to so many of us. Having, having 10 minutes to do something can be terrifying to my nervous system, whereas the five-second practice is just right. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, Scott. I just wanted to put that in. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, we have a couple more questions. Um, Patricia, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, hi. I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, obviously, it's a good opportunity to ask this because this is kind of a combination of spiritual and psychotherapy I mean like as you do as you kind of go further along the, the spiritual path um, and I've been a practitioner for 20 years things fall apart and they're meant to fall apart like for example in the book the heart attack sutra and a lot of stuff around that I think can be really can be really traumatizing your sense of self your ego everything is getting dismantled um your perception changes, especially in Tibetan and Buddhism, they talk about seeing everybody as a Buddha and seeing everything as a Buddha realm. If I was to go to a regular psychotherapist and say, I see everything as a Buddha realm and everybody is a Buddha, they would, they would say I was psychotic, that my view of reality was, 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 was um, delusional. So, you know, as you're opening up on the spiritual path and you're realising as well that other teachers, um, and, and, and lots of people who've been on the path a lot longer. You have cities, including kind of clairvoyance and things like this. And all of these are, are completely real within these worlds, especially Tibetan Buddhism. Um, how on earth do you marry that? Because a trigger is only a trigger if you're delusional about somebody actually actually provoking you. But it's it's not delusional if you have a teacher who is clairvoyant, who is pushing your buttons to push you further down the path, it can still be traumatizing and really de destabilizing and it's fertile ground, fertile ground for paranoia and all kinds of difficult stuff. So I'm just wondering, you know, if there's anyone, anyone has any comments, and it's a perfect opportunity because I can't say this normally to a psychotherapist because I just get labeled as psychotic. Thanks. Oops. I bet Rob, I bet Rob yeah. probably has some insights into that one. <laughs> <laughs> Given his no, dual no guarantee, no guarantee. <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's lots of quite complex issues involved in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And um, one of them will be to do with the assumptions we make about teachers 
um, and how much power we give them in terms of whether um, we feel congruent with what's going on or whether we feel it could be actually destructive in some way or not aligned with what feels healthy for me. To what extent am I willing to say that in relationship to someone that I revere as a teacher? Because it brings into question the validity of what they're saying. But I think we, we have some responsibility to ourselves to actually listen to our own inner teacher, not the outer one, more than giving everything over to the outer teacher. And instead begin to really trust in what I know feels true for me or feels healthy for me that feels congruent with with where I need to be unfolding rather than um, assuming that outer people know what we need to do I think that would be a very simple answer <laughs> yeah yeah that's very reasonable I don't know does that sound reasonable does that sound unreasonable to say it sounds them. very reasonable to me, and and I think um, you know where where I would would go is is to say that that you know our our job in the helping profession, and so a job perhaps as a spiritual teacher is to is to stretch, is to help our another person stretch, right? To 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 push to stretch to to um, disrupt so that we can reorganize and if we go over the line to where we have now pushed another system into a survival state, all of that stops because the, the, the science tells us you can't um, move through a change process. If you're in a survival state, it, it is impossible. It is not a both and it's an either or. So as soon as my system goes into a survival state, change stops, that process stops. And so my work in the therapy world is is to help is to get to the edge there where where yeah. change is is happening but not go over that edge and so i you know like you said rob i'd be looking to see what feels you know is, is this am i in the, the the just right place or have i gone over the line where where i can no longer be in a change process yeah and i think the body again one of those things about listening Right, Deb, that you picked up on so deeply and so so well at the beginning is this deep sense of deep listening. Mm -hmm. And if you are listening to the body, the body will tell you when you have reached the limit. Right? The body will tell you if this feels abusive or not. Right? The body will, if you're listening to it, right? You know, there's there's a wonderful quote that says that the soul always knows how to heal itself if you can just quiet the mind yeah right yeah. and so it's one of those things where sometimes you have to shut out the outside voices mm -hmm. and understand that we come in my belief we come to this realm knowing everything we need to know we've just forgotten mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to shut out the outside voice that is confusing what you already know and get back in touch with what you know I, to, just to add to that i i think one of the hazards of becoming involved in spiritual traditions like the, the Tibetan tradition or whatever is that we're given many prescriptions of how we're supposed to do certain things and what that can do is to take us away from actually really responding to what we need to be doing because it's an external you know there's a lot of authority in the external field but can I come back to listen to what's what's true for me because it, in a way it's the trying to do that right that's getting going to get in the way of the true unfolding of our nature the whole time. The more we try, the less we're going to get there. So the more we try and do it in accordance with prescriptions, probably the less we're going to find the experiences that we might seek in some way. Yeah. Laurie has a question here. We only have time for one or two more. But Laurie has yeah. a question. Hi. Um, I don't know if this is going to be a coherent question, but there's a mm -hmm. bunch of different threads that I'm trying to pull together. Um, so Rob, I totally appreciated what you just said, because one of the, one of the questions that I have is around uh, trauma sensitive practices, you know, that in Buddhist communities in particular, because there are prescribed practices and implied ways of being, yep. you know, getting back to the way Deb talked about 
when I think of myself as this, then I limit, I, I actually constrict and I actually uh, solidify something, right? And for someone who may have trauma that comes in, the, the question is about how we can create the container, the environment uh, for that kind of safe exploration to happen. And one of the things that I appreciate about Resma's work and Deb's work around working with anchors and the somatic experience is that for some people saying, you've got to sit still and you've got to be quiet and you have to contain everything within your body, mm -hmm. but your body is freaking out at, the, at that moment and it needs to have movement or it needs a different way to anchor rather than staying with your breath or with, with a particular object, that there can be harm that happens that's not actually intended but because of the structure, the structural pieces of maybe Western Buddhism, perhaps, I don't know enough about Eastern Buddhism to know, but, but that even to step back out into the larger question of like, how has, how has our Buddhist institutions in, for example, in the West um, been influenced by um, white supremacy, for example, or, or white culture that expects a particular form that, that might actually do disservice to this healing process of being able to, to be with that somatic experience. Um, and, and for myself, uh, one of the things is, is that I see the collective piece of of me as an Asian woman being expected to be passive and quiet and to not speak up. And we have this other piece of Buddhism of right speech that says, if I see something that I don't, that, that doesn't feel right to me, I can't speak it out into a, into a Buddhist environment because, oh, that might be perceived as wrong speech which then silences that and, and creates even more uh, disturbance or even more triggering. And so maybe just to, to perhaps speak to that piece, you know, sometimes some of, some of our teachings can be weaponized in ways that, that shut people down <laughs> as opposed to opening them up and creating a safer space for, for healing. Mm -hmm. So it's a big question, but. I just wanted to speak that into the space. Yeah. Good question. Really good question. A, another big question. You know, I, I, I'll say this, but I, I'm, I've just finished a series with white Christian congregations um, entitled God in Whiteface, the Racialization of Religion in America. And what I started out with was, was this understanding that if we've lied about God, then we've lied about everything, right? And in some ways, in all of our institutionalized religions, understandings, ways of being, there is a creation, yes, for the essence of the thing in itself, but also for its own survival. Right? And so there's naturally a shutting down of any voice contrary to its survival. Right? But if we go back to the spirit of the thing, right? if we go back to right thinking, am I perceiving this correctly? Right? Right, right viewing, am I perceiving this thing correctly? If the answer is yes, then that leads you to your next step. Right? Then, um, you know, then I maybe perhaps need to speak out about this. And what I've told folks, which is very difficult for people, um, I've been kicked out of a lot of places because of, <laughs> because of this, right? But if it's not working for me, and I know it's not working for me, or as Nina Simone said, if, if love is no longer being served, then you have to get up from the table. It's very difficult, right? Because that creates a different kind of trauma. Um, that experience can, if you hang on to it, as Rob and Deb have, have pointed out, right, can create a different level of trauma. 
and of feeling alone and all of those things. But for me, it's a, it's a decision, right? For me, the choice is be my full self, scars, wounds, joys, brilliance, all of that, or be, um, be in the image of someone else where I am denying myself, where I don't feel at home with me. And I can't live a life where I'm not at home with me because I'm the only home I got. Yeah, yeah. Can I, I'd like to follow on with that, if I may. Um, Laurie, I think, I think your, your comments and your questions are really incredibly important at this particular time in history in terms of um, the relationship between, say, the Tibetan tradition coming to the West in particular. And, and what I would say is that I, I think certainly my journey with that has been I've tried to find what the essence of this is about and how it informs my transformation in a way that is congruent with me, we, me as a Westerner. I'm not a Tibetan. I can never do Tibetan Buddhism, actually, if I'm really honest about it. And, and although I steeped myself in it fully, what I began to realize was a bit like David's saying, I wasn't being true to me. I, I was I was falsifying something. And so I had to really step into a process of what really works for me with this and how do I start to, to find a way through it. I guess I was very fortunate that I had a Tibetan guide who was very creative and very unorthodox and was willing to say, we need to make it our experience and we need to be creative around it and, and to really find what's true for us and what works for us within, within a deep understanding of the essence of what this is about. And, and that feels like an extraordinary journey that we're on. And I think if we can let go of the fears around, well, it may change or it may be different or whatever, and, and are we preserving something and all that sort of thing, and instead really see that this is a living process that we are part of, and, and we can step into that fully. And we'll never become clones of the Buddha. We become who we are, you know, and we have to find our own way with that. And, and that's a, that feels to me a great source of... of liberation and creative joy actually if i can step out of my my fears about i'm going to get it wrong or, or maybe the authority says it should be like this but instead really trust in my creative process and how i can how i can shape what i need to bring into my life as a buddhist it's very rich it feels very inspiring actually mm. it's really really beautiful to think about it that way and and Again, in, in, in my work um, with, in the therapy world where there's so many protocols and so many manualized ways of working that, are, that just aren't going to get us where we need to go. I've, I've come to tell my clients and now I tell everyone, um, find the way of your nervous system, mm. right? That's the way, the way of your, your nervous system. It will, it will show you the way. So, yeah. Mm. Yep. Mm. Said and Marco, um, I think I'll hand it off to you now for either one last question or a wrap up, depending on the time. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. I'm afraid that yeah. we need to wrap up because we're um, getting towards time and we want to respect everyone's time. Um, but I think it has been such a rich conversation. And, you know, I think especially bringing all of this out of the silence and bringing this into this room, into this space. Uh, I hope that's just the beginning of a journey for many to start to be more comfortable with their own pain or trauma or anything of suffering that might be there. So I hope that this evening was helpful for many. And uh, I would like to thank you all so much, uh, Deb, uh, David, Rob, it was such a joy to have you here. And thank you so much for your skillful ways in holding the space here tonight. Yeah.